In today's story and art, we're gonna be blending fantasy and science fiction together. In December, a bunch of my subscribers submitted their own original fantasy monster creations, and I'm gonna show off the submissions that were sent in, as well as redesign a few of them with a bit of a demonic mechanical twist to fit into today's story, which will be largely set in a fantasy universe, but will be led by one of my main science fiction characters, Bustar Terminax. Hope y'all enjoy the show, let's go. Hit like, if you want. Subscribe, if you feel like, but either way, Enjoy the show. Bustard Terminax vacation log. Though, to be honest, I don't think many folks other than me would consider what I've just been through a vacation. Bustard, do you really think this is the best time to record this? Your injuries are quite severe. You should be resting to recover and regain your strength. I'm fine, ship. My body's 23% self-repair and cybernetics, and the rest of me heals up pretty fast, too. I want to get this down while it's fresh. Anyway, where should I pick this up? The universe that I'm from, by the standards of most other places in the multiverse, would probably be considered pretty futuristic. We got space travel, interplanetary trade routes, laser guns, I don't know what else, it's all normal to me, but the kind of stuff that some worlds would consider to be science fiction, I guess. For a long while now, my universe has had the tech to transport to other dimensions, but that's been blocked off and outlawed by this group called the Intergalactic Safety Commission. Till recently, that is. I'd heard rumors that someone had taken out the head of the commission, and that the whole thing had been disbanded. Then a couple of weeks ago, I finally got that confirmed, with this guy that I work with named Asmuth. He's a researcher out on Ishkonigan Major, the nature reserve planet where I take the dangerous and beautiful beasties that I hunt down, now that I ain't killing the stuff I track no more. Turned out he actually knew the head of the commission. He altered some tech for her, called a biomech once, so that she could use it, because apparently the thing didn't agree with her body or something. Anyway, the point is, he had some connections and found out that it was in fact true. The commission was gone, and multiversal travel was open for business again. I knew exactly where I wanted to go first. My old man used to tell me about this dimension that he'd traveled to before the days of the safety commission, D-107. The place ran on magic, not on tech. And even though there were different planes of existence in that one universe, almost all sentient life activity happened on one crazy busy planet called Toriel. Best of all, he said it was a place full of beautiful monsters like nothing I'd have seen in our universe. Just to clarify, Bostar, was this your biological father that told you this, or the warlord who took you from your parents when you were young? Warlord, dadship. Kahurgoth may have been a pretty messed up guy who, I now know, has done a lot of pretty unforgivable stuff. Try to not even think about what he apparently did back in Dimension H224, but I could always tell he cared about me. Anyway, it had always been a dream of mine to come to D107, so once I got my hands on a multiversal warp drive and installed it into ship, we were off. But when we got there, there was a bit more familiar stuff than I would have expected. First thing I saw was civilians, and even some monsters, lined up to protect the edge of this big town, but what they were protecting it from looked like it'd be more at home in my dimension than this one. There were a bunch of monsters that I later learned were native to this world, but they were all infected with some kind of mechanical tech. I mean, they got tech looking stuff like Warforged tier that could maybe pass as droids in my dimension, but nothing like this. I didn't know what exactly was going on, but figured I might be able to find these things' weaknesses better than some of the folks from around here. Ship stayed cloaked above the battlefield and scanned the main swarm of these monsters. Later was told that the locals called them Heronian Snap Frills, but from scanning them what I learned was, for one thing, they were all dead. Their bodies were all just being animated by the tech virus on them, which itself was not alive, just running on programs made by somebody else. And for another thing, I learned that this tech was seriously upgrading their strength and firepower. Another thing I learned later on is that snap frills are usually raised eating a certain type of gemstone depending on where they're born, and the type they eat usually ends up determining the kind of dangerous gases they can spit from their mouths when they're older, as well as the effect that the gas has, like causing hallucinations or even turning people into solid gold if they inhale it. But since the infection took them over, they could all use a whole bunch of different gases. On top of that, they could shoot spikes from their tails and had teeth that could bite through stone. They were only about four feet tall, but with a few dozen of them storming this town with some other monsters in tow, it wasn't looking good for these people. But I wasn't about to let this techno-organic infection ruin my first vacation to D-107. 
Ship stayed cloaked and flew above the gathered warriors and townsfolk, turning so its jets were facing the approaching monsters. I leapt out in front of all the folks holding my flame and lightning shooting pyrogalf staff, wearing a gas mask, and looked back at him to say, Don't worry, folks. Bustard Terminax has got your back. Was really playing up the whole otherworldly savior thing, because why not? It's my vacation. I'll do what I want. Then some of those critters got close enough to start shooting their gas towards us, so ship kicked on its jets and blasted the gas right back at them. Even sent some of those critters rolling back too. Then I ran into the fight and for the first time in a while I didn't have to hold back in the slightest. Since I stopped killing the critters I hunted, I've had to go easy on most of my marks. But since ship's scans confirmed that these things were already dead, I could just go all out. And luckily my pyro gal's electricity seemed to work pretty good against the tech virus on these things. I was kicking and swinging and zapping my way through this army like they were paper dolls. They had me pretty surrounded at one point, but I had ship streaming a visual of the battlefield from above right into my head so I could see if anything was shooting at me from behind. Got clipped a few times by the thing's tail needles, but nothing I couldn't fight through. But even if I was keeping myself safe and taking out a lot of these things, and I do mean a lot of them, plenty were still getting past me and headed for the townsfolk. Some of the people looked like they were experienced with a battle, but a lot of them were clearly pretty green to fighting. Luckily, I wasn't the only heavy hitter here to help. Soon enough, this white and blue dragon flew out over the battlefield, and off it dropped a whole team of knights in different kinds of sick-looking armor. I didn't learn their names in the heat of the battle, but now I know we had their leader, Bruno Torres, who had one really decked out arm, but besides that in his pants, he had the stones to just run into battle without so much as a pair of shoes on. Then there was Dryadia, who had horse or goat legs or something, and came in hot dual wielding a spear and a knife. There was this Galtera, who called herself the last of the Skygazer Knights, and she had a wingsuit and a glowing orange sword. She was flying through and slicing up monsters before they even knew she was there. The dragon's name was Wingsweep, and he was roasting the monsters with his flame breath from above. But then we get to my two favorites of the group. One was Ungu. He ran in from the crowd. He was a big guy with a big warhammer and was too heavy for their dragon to carry into battle with the rest of them. But once he was there, he was flattening monsters faster than anyone else fighting. Hopeteo was the last of them and she was more about speed. She had wolf or fox ears or something, and I could tell just from observing in that fight that she had elevated senses. Along with a pretty scarred up face, which I personally respected and thought looked pretty cool. But the best part of watching her fight was the clawed gauntlets she was wearing. Used those things to tear the monsters to pieces. Usually with a beating as bad as the one we were given to these monsters, the opposing army would have retreated. But I guess when you're not actually alive, you don't care too much about dying, so they just kept coming right down until the last one. Luckily, we did eventually get them all taken out with very few civilian casualties. In the end, I grouped up with these secret knights as they called themselves, and they appreciated my help, but also told me that this was far from all the infected beasties they were dealing with in Dimension D107. The whole world was under attack. The Secret Knights told me this infection invasion had been going on in their world for almost a month. This techno-demon that called herself Cypheromob had shown up in their dimension not far from where I dropped into this world, and had started infecting thousands of different monsters and people to have them go on killing and infecting even more of their dimension's residents. I figured they'd be surprised to hear I was from another dimension, but apparently they were from another themselves. Heck, their dragon wing sweep was even secretly a Cybertronian. They'd gotten transported here a few years ago after some big mess in their own world. I offered to take them back to their dimension, but they said this place had become more of a home to them now. Anyway, the Secret Knights had just come back to this area after helping out in a city called Gibralt, because they learned that the demon Cypheromov had taken over a nearby castle and had issued a challenge to anyone who thought they could beat her toughest infected beasties. In fact, she'd sent out word to all the neighboring kingdoms that if you could make your way through the dungeon of her castle and kill the final infected demon she had down there, then she'd willingly erase all her infected from this world and leave. But there was a catch. You had to slay her monsters with weapons she provided. No spells or potion while you were down there neither. Use some kind of murder spell or your own fancy blades, and the deal's off. 
She'd even rigged up these funky looking jumbotrons outside all the neighboring towns, and cameras all over the dungeon, so people could watch as various teams of three warriors at a time went down there and tried to beat the boss. Since she'd made the challenge, over 50 sets of warriors had gone down in there, and none of them had come back out. Sounded like a pretty fun challenge to me. Told the knights I could get them to this castle faster if they hopped into ship, so we all piled in. They got a little disoriented being in a spaceship, other than wing sweep of course, and we blasted off to the castle the demon had taken over. Even from a far distance we could see that this place was overrun with infected monsters. They were swarming the skies and ground and the moat of this place. Thought ship being cloak might have given us an element of surprise and we could maybe go straight for the demon herself, but I probably should have known better. When we got close, ship's screens all got taken over by the demon, who was obviously a bit surprised to see a craft like mine in this world. Told her I was there to stop her from ruining my vacation. Said we were going to make quick work of her little dungeon challenge. That turned out to be a little bit cocky of me. Zypheromov let us land and enter the castle, and she had a walkway cleared out for the hunting party to come in, choose their weapons, and go inside. Since only three could go at a time, the secret knights had been planning to send in Bruno, Ungu, and Hope. But I gave him a counter offer since I was really gunning to go in myself. And I had a way to make sure that none of us had to die if it did turn out to be more than we could handle. A couple weeks before leaving for this vacation, I'd installed some upgraded tech linking the mechanics in me to ship. Both for better communication and so ship could teleport me out of any difficult situation I was in along with anyone I was holding on to. It truly was incredibly convenient timing that we installed the ability just before this adventure. Yeah, things have really been seeming to work out more for me lately. Other than the severe injuries you've acquired in the last few weeks. Eh, nothing but a few good battle scars. Anyway, pointed out that Cypheromov said no potions, spells, or outside weapons against her beasts, but didn't say nothing about using technology to teleport out of there if things got too hairy. So, if I fought alongside two of the knights, things get bad, I poured us out of there, and we can always heal up with some potions outside, so we weren't breaking the rules about using a potion in the dungeon, then just try again. Despite the upside of them all having a lot of experience fighting with each other, they knew it was a pretty undeniably good offer for me to go. They decided to drop Torres from the roster and send Ungu and Hope in with me. Torres had been going because he was the leader of the team, not because he was the best fighter of their group, and Hope and Ungu had good opposite skill sets. Hope was fast, and Ungu was strong. Dryadia had learned a lot of spells and potions since coming to this world, and would have been perfect if we could have used any of the stuff that she could actually craft and conjure. More important though, the three of us could all see in the dark. That would be necessary for the last thing we were going to have to fight. The selection of weapons was better looking than I thought. I figured Cypheromov would have been offering up ragged garbage blades or something, but there were dozens of things I'd never even heard of. And all of them looked pretty sturdy, if a bit blood splattered from previous wielders. Ungu grabbed a weapon that was pretty similar to his own hammer, and Hope even found another set of clawed gauntlets. I saw some spears like my galve, but I wasn't really feeling it. Instead, I grabbed myself a nice, hefty longsword, and a dagger. Ungu pointed out the longswords are supposed to be held two-handed, but then I spun it around in one hand and chopped one of the tables holding weapons in half with a single swipe. He let out a good burly laugh and said, I like this guy. The feelings were mutual. The other knights talked me through the layout of this place, since they'd watched a few groups go through on Cypheromov's screens. There'd be three monsters, but some of them might be different from past groups since some of the hunters had managed to kill the first two monsters in their quests down here, but nobody had ever beaten the Shadow Stalker at the end. After that, we started on down. The windy dungeon was surprisingly wide and tall. Through my eye, ship scanned it at about 30 feet high and 50 feet wide. Some of the prisons down here were big too, and had bones and rotting bodies of different creatures inside. Made me sick to think of those poor critters rotting away in cells down there. Could have very well been the work of whoever owned the castle before Cypheromov took it over, but still, got me good and riled up for a fight. The place was lined with torches and plenty of cameras. Didn't know how many people were watching, but I was going to give them a show. Let them see what Bustar Terminax can do. We got to the area where the first monster usually showed up, and the whole place got real cold all of a sudden. We stayed close with weapons ready and looked toward every possible hiding place. Ship did a thermo scan, but there was no trace of anything living with warm blood. But, of course, that's not what we were looking for anyway. 
I stared into a few different prison cells until I finally saw something that was more solid and sturdy than the other corpses we'd seen. It wasn't moving, not even breathing. Could have just been another dead monster. Something fell off. I took one step towards it, and that's when the first barrage of frozen daggers came at me. I was able to dodge around the ice shards, and they weren't hard enough to break through Ungu's armor, so he took the brunt of the blast. The thing I'd been staring at had been our first demon critter. Hope said she recognized it as a cryogoyle. They spit ice blades, turn to ice in the sun, and usually have a weak point on the underside of their neck. But this version's whole neck was covered up by its tech virus. Wasn't much way we were getting any sunlight down here neither. Dryadia had potions that could make a big area completely engulfed in sunlight, but if we'd been allowed to bring that down here, we probably would have saved it for the final boss anyway. Knowing its weak points weren't going to help much, so we had to take this thing down with grit alone. Hope used her speed to try and keep the thing distracted, darting in and clawing at the thing's fleshy bits before it started any attack on me and Ungu. The big guy was going for headshots with his hammer, and I was going for the legs. I got a nice big slash into one of them early on, but then saw that ice filled in the gap pretty quick. But that gave me an idea. Probably wouldn't move so well once most of its body had turned back into ice. Hope and I started slicing away as much of the thing's flesh as possible, so that ice would fill in more and more of the gaps. Unfortunately, that was taking its sweet time. We must have been fighting this thing for a half hour straight before I started actually noticing it slowing down. And once it did, it showed off that it had another move. The mech bits on its neck shifted and turned, and its throat started to glow white. Then it shot a beam of frigid air while it spun itself in a circle. I wasn't fast enough to dodge it, and neither was Ungu. The thing didn't freeze us in place, but it was far none the coldest I ever been. Felt like my bones were grinding together as I tried to move after that. Luckily, Hope had seen it coming and dove to hide right underneath the thing's stomach, so she kept on distracting the thing and taking more chunks off it, while Ungu and I tried to get back in it. Soon enough, one of its front legs was entirely turned to ice, so as slow as he was moving, Ungu got in there to take a swing and shattered its limb to bits. After that, it got a lot easier. No big glorious final strike like I would have wanted to show people watching, but at least we beat the thing. Though, realizing we still had two more to go was pretty rough. We each grabbed ourselves one of the torches off the walls and did our best to start warming up, but after only ten minutes of rest, we found out the second critter wasn't willing to wait around for us to recover. We were sitting there trying to relax and this freaky furry giraffe thing gallops in with its head down. Ungu was thinking he was warmed up enough to head this thing off, so he steps forward ready to grab this thing and wrestle it down, but it hits him like a freight ship and sends him flying into the wall. Hope was on it again with what this thing was, or had been before getting infected. She called it a dino giraffarus, and they had hard heads but real soft noses. Of course, this thing's whole face was covered up by mech bits. She also said to watch for its tongue, but I learned about that the hard way. I was still moving too slow from the cold to dodge when this thing's tongue came at me. It stuck to my chest, and before I could chop it off, the mech bits infecting the beast used the tongue to send a couple hundred volts of electricity into me. I got some electric dampeners in me, but it was still enough to keep me from moving. By the time Hope slashed the thing's tongue so it had to pull it off me, I was feeling pretty rough. And it just got worse from there. If we were gonna get beaten, I would've wanted it to be by some big dragon or something that actually looked vicious, not some sparky tongued giraffe. Could've handled it if we weren't beat from the first monster, but eventually I realized if I didn't get us out of there, we were as good as dead. I grabbed Hope and Ungu and we ported back into ship. Of course, we weren't done, just had to heal up for round two. But I hated the thought of all those folks haven't seen us get beat so bad. I was going to make sure the next round we gave him a better show, prove to him that this demon and her minions were nothing to be afraid of. But didn't prove that nearly as quick as I would have wanted to. Ungu, Hope, and I went in again the next day after a good sleep and a couple potions each. Thought Cypheramov might try and tell us that we cheated, but no such gripe came. We knew there would be a new first monster, and luckily we figured out how to deal with it a lot faster. It was a big bundle of shambling vines, but by spreading out and making it try to go after all of us at once, we got its vines separated enough to chop it to pieces before it could wear us out too much. For the Dino Giraffarus, we came up with a few ideas. First one didn't work out so well, getting it to shock itself with its own tongue. 
guess different infected got different abilities because the shock didn't work on it the way it had on the snap frills. Eventually, we got Ungu to goad it into charging at him again, but instead of trying to take it down, he jumped onto its head to weigh it down. Then, Hope leapt onto it as well, and both of them worked at yanking off the metal plating over its nose. They got smashed into walls by it a couple times, but I started slowing its thrashing by going for its knees. Finally, they got the plating out of the way, and Hope dug her claws right through the thing's nose. It was out of commission. Of course, that still left the toughest monster of all of them, the one few had reached and none had beat. We knew the first thing we had to do when we got close enough to it was snuff out any light source in sight. Ungu would be a bit hindered because his eyesight was pretty good in the dark but not perfect. Hope and I got our own kinds of night vision. Turns out she was experimented on as a kid too. In a different way than me though and she wasn't as willing a subject as I was. Anyway, we knew the monster down here was called the Shadow Stalker. It's a four-legged drake with indestructible horns and a spiked tail. It can turn into smoke to retreat if it needs to, or spit smoke to blind its opponents. But the most important thing about it is it consumes shadows. Same way plants photosynthesize sunlight, this thing absorbs power from shadows and can heal up if there's enough of them around. One of the best ways to take these things out is usually to use a spell that completely engulfs them and their surroundings in sunlight. If that didn't kill the thing, it'd at least paralyze it enough for us to finish it off. But with no spells being an option, the only other way to get rid of the shadows was to get rid of all the light. No light means nothing to cast a shadow. Which, yeah, you could say everything is just in shadow when there's no light, but Dryadia had checked a few sources to confirm this thing needs shadows that were cast from a light source to power up. Of course, it'd probably already be plenty charged up with its time in this torchlit dungeon. Plenty of walls casting shadows down there, but at least with all of them snuffed, the damage we did to it would probably stick. When we got to an area Hope and Ungu recognized from having watched the previous folks come down here, we started knocking off all the torches. There were a lot of them, but we were making pretty good headway without the thing having shown up yet. Or so we thought. As we were getting deeper and deeper in, I started noticing the air seemed more thick. Even the areas near the unsnuffed torches were weirdly dark. That's when I realized the Shadow Stalker had already found us. Called out for the others to group up, but the Stalker's mist gathered up together in between us all, and it took its solid form. As it finished, it was already swinging its tail at me. I got my sword up to block it in time, but the hit was a lot harder than I expected. I held my sword firm between its two spikes, but it pushed me right up against the wall, and my arms buckled. One of its spikes hit the wall beside my head, but the other stabbed right through my shoulder. Don't remember what kind of sound I made, but definitely wasn't one that would have given folks watching much to cheer for. Ungu and Hope didn't fare much better, and less than a minute after finding the thing, we grouped up and had to pour it out of there again. It was a pretty annoying loss to get beat so quick, but I knew it didn't actually matter in the long term. I was not going to stop going down there till that thing was finished. Sifarimov wasn't going to beat me. No demon that kills animals en masse to do its bidding was going to get the better of Bustar Terminax. Over the next two weeks, I went back into that dungeon over and over and over again. We tried a couple different combos of people, even brought Wing Sweep in once, but using weapons the size of what Sifarimov provided wasn't much good for the big guy. No matter what pairing we took, though, every time we eventually got outclassed by that snargin' Shadow Stalker. Got hurt pretty bad a few times, so did some of the Secret Knights, and healing spells can only take you so far. But the thing that really hurt was the thought of all those people watching us fail over and over again. At first, that kind of just hurt because, you know, I don't like people seeing me lose so much. Could hear the hunters back home in my dimension telling me that I'd gotten weak since I stopped killing on my hunts. But eventually, the reason it grinded my guts got bigger and more important. We ran out of healing potions and had to go back into town to get more. While we were there, I heard folks talking who'd been watching and they sounded even more defeated than we felt. They were talking like all we were doing by going in there over and over was proven that Sifarimov's monsters couldn't actually be beaten. That this world was doomed and she was eventually going to wipe out everyone and everything here. But that was when something kind of clicked for me. When we'd fought that army of her goons on our terms using our weapons, we'd sweep those freaks no problem. Sure, the creatures in the dungeon were a tougher breed, but still. That was when I started talking this through with the knights. I pointed out, why would the demon bother doing any of this dungeon challenge thing in the first place? I don't know a ton about demons, but 
given the last person I met who made demons, I'm willing to bet they get a kick out of demoralizing people and making them feel weak and helpless. Might even suit her bigger cause. If people think that their best champions can't take her beasts, then they're less likely to stand up to them themselves. More likely, they'd just run and hide. The night started catching on to where I was going. I got Dryadia to tell us anything else she knew about Shadowstalkers. She said it was known that silver-laced weapons were particularly good against them, but seeing as how we couldn't choose our own weapons outside Cypheramov's options, that knowledge hadn't been much help to us before. But that got me wondering what the weapons we were using were made of. The other infected we'd fought had all had the tech virus protecting their best weak points, so maybe the Shadowstalkers virus had found a way to shift its whole biology to not be weak to silver, maybe even resistant to it. Then giving us silver-laced weapons would be a great way for her to guarantee we never beat her last monster. With all that in mind, I told the gang my new plan I was making, and as I would have expected, some were kinda hesitant, but eventually we all decided it was probably worth the downside. Next time we were selecting weapons, I immediately got shipped to scan them for silver. Just as expected, they were all laced with it. Didn't necessarily confirm my theory, but it was good enough. I nodded at Ungu in hope that we were on. This time, I took a blade, but I also took my pyrogalve with me too. As we were about to step into the dungeon, Cypheramov spoke through one of her demons, reminding me that the deal was off if I used my own weapon. I told her I was just bringing the thing in as a back scratcher. She said, I know you're lying, Otherworlder, and I just replied, look who's talking, then pushed past her into the dungeon. A truly clever and subtly cutting response, Bustar. It was quite a pleasure to observe that encounter. Yeah, thanks, Ship. It was pretty fun for me, too. I don't know if Cypheramov would've even let me in if she knew it was lying in my pockets then and there, but luckily she didn't check. Ungu Hope and I were all more ready than on any other attempt. First beast we got to was a new one, some kind of infected ogre, but we didn't care too much. I quickly pulled out three stun discs from my pocket, ones that I used back home for hunting xenomorphs, and tossed them onto the thing. As I hoped, it was stunned, but its tech virus started spreading down its body to try and get rid of them. Before that could happen though, Ungu smashed the thing's legs out from under it, and Hope clawed its neck apart and yanked the thing's head off. I looked right up at the camera, knowing folks would be confused about what we were doing using outside weapons. Told him this demon wants you to think that her monsters are too tough to handle. She wants you to see us fail and to beat them so that you think you've got no shot at fighting them either. But that ain't true. We've just been making them look tougher than they are by using her weapons, playing by her rules. But you play by a demon's rules and you're always gonna get the results a demon wants. We made it down to the next monster. This one an infected, big, snargin hellhound of some kind. Threw more stun discs onto it, but they didn't work this time. The thing spat a cannon of flames at me, but I whipped out my pyrogalve and shot flames back at it, blocking its stream in midair. Its techno virus kicked in though and fueled it up even more. Its fire became green and shot a lot harder and faster. I had to dive out of the way and hide in one of the prison cells, but I distracted it long enough anyway. Hope was just finishing giving Ungu a little boost. See, Dryadia had been teaching Hope some spells and had sent her down there with what she needed to use a few of them. She conjured a spell called Bull's Strength onto the big guy, like he wasn't strong enough. Then she lunged to the ground near the hound, faking an attack so it would aim its fire at her, giving Ungu the space to leap through the air onto its head. He grabbed both of its horns and snapped them off, then drove one into its skull and the other into the main point of infected tech on its back. Just like that, it dropped. We kept on marching tall down through the tunnel. Didn't know if people watching would be cheering us on or cursing us for not following the demon's rules, and possibly ruining this whole thing, but it felt like the only way to give people real hope. We didn't bother snuffing the lights this time, we were going the opposite route. The Shadow Stalker stomped onto the scene and I immediately pulled out one of Dryadia's sunlight potions. I tossed it right at the thing's feet and its entire body became engulfed in sunlight. It shrieked in fury but was totally paralyzed. Could barely see the thing through the light, but I marched up with Cypheramov's blade and slashed the thing over and over and over again. The spell lasted 60 seconds and the whole time I hacked at it with the silver laced blade. When the light dimmed, the creature slumped to the ground, but still hissed furiously, practically uninjured. After all that, it barely had a scratch on it. Just as I thought. Ungu and Hope distracted the thing for another minute while I looked back at the cameras. Told folks, you see that? Her weapons don't do jack to that thing. She knew nobody would ever be able to beat it fighting it her way. But here's what happens when you play by your own snargin rules. 
I tossed another sunlight potion at the thing and it was paralyzed again. Then I tossed one straight into its open throat so light was consuming its entire innards as well. I spun my pyrogalve around, thrust it into the thing's mouth, and kicked on the flames. Light and fire exploded through its pores. By the time the potion's lights dimmed, the Shadow Stalker was nothing but a withering pile of ash and discarded tech. Hadn't been done by the demon's weapons, but we'd finally beaten the dungeon. Not long after, a screen emerged from the ground with Cypheramov's face on it. She sort of sarcastically congratulated us, but acknowledged that we'd figured out her scheme. The more folks feared her demons, the more effective they'd be. She said she was impressed and as a partial reward she'd leave this world for now but everything she'd already infected would stay behind. I don't know what exactly her angle is, and I'm sure we can't trust her, but at least folks now know that her beasts aren't unbeatable. We got back to town and some folks were conflicted about what we did, but most were pretty grateful. We got a nice big free meal at the best pub in town, along with a ton of ale that honestly tasted like dirt to me, but weirdly still managed to hit the spot. Told the knights I'd stick around a bit longer, help get rid of more of the infected, but that I would have to go home soon enough. Got my own responsibilities with the Ishkonians and the beasts of my world. But all in all, I gotta say, it was a pretty great first vacation to another dimension. New background for the month is up. I will most likely be doing a Design Notes podcast episode about this to go out on the Popcraft Studios Patreon, which, reminder, is now free for everybody. But I'm not 100% sure yet. Some external circumstances have meant I've been a little bit behind schedule, so I'm a bit late working on Monday's video as well. But I'm going to try and get it out there. And the high-resolution art and inks for this episode will be up a day after this video is released. Over on the Patreon, free for everybody, link in the description. I was incredibly grateful to see all of the awesome submissions that you all sent in for the fantasy monsters, and as usual, a special thank you to the people who were picked. Mad About Boost, Fantastic Francisco, Strawberry Impact, and Joshua Neath. Also, if you want to know more about Bustar Terminax, I think he's got one of the more interesting stories in terms of Popcross Studios narrators that you kind of learn through the progression of his regular episodes. I'll link his playlist, that's a good one. And now for the first redraw of 2024, I want you to submit either a psychological thriller demon, one that would be a minion of Psycho Paradelict, our psychological thriller themed Archon Demon, or a horror demon that would be a minion of Eldrorok, our horror Archon. I'm actually going to be choosing eight people for this redraw because I'm going to be taking a psychological thriller demon and a horror demon and fusing them together for a story that I think is going to be quite fun. Reminder that the deadline I put on screen is the day that submissions are due by, not the day that the video is going to be coming out. And the one place to submit is popcrossanimations at gmail.com. Very excited to see what you all submit, but besides that, that's all for today, except of course for ending this video on some kind of positive or inspiring note. And the thought I want to leave people with today is a quote that I don't actually remember what the source is, but it's stuck in my head and I really like it. That's that on days where you're only feeling 40% your best and you give 40% to whatever it is you're doing, you have given 100%. I hope that's inspiring. I love you all and I'll see you all in the next episode on Monday.